Hey, thank you for joining us for an episode of The Medicine Mentors, where we interview leading physicians on the best tips, lessons, and pathways to mastery for aspiring physicians. Our mission is to learn from top mentors the most effective paths to mastery and fulfillment in medicine and to spread their knowledge. Dr. William Nelson joins us for this episode to share his insights garnered from an outstanding career in oncology. Dr. Nelson is the director of the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. He is a renowned professor of oncology, urology, pharmacology, medicine, pathology, and radiation oncology, and is also a recognized leader in translational research for cancer. Working with his fellow colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Nelson discovered the most common genome alteration in prostate cancer. In this episode, he discusses the connection between clinical excellence and research excellence, tells us how to become invaluable in our work, emphasizes the rare art of critical thinking, and touches on some issues affecting physicians and residents in our current culture. Thank you for listening to the following wisdom from Dr. Nelson. As a leader in research and education who has made profound contributions, his advice should be put to good use. What are the ingredients and what's the secret to your success, Dr. Nelson? I think that there is an idea that is quite prevalent in the world that uh, there is some huge difference between clinical excellence and research excellence. I think that's a false belief. Mm -hmm. The best physician scientists and physician scientists that I know Mm -hmm. have a deep knowledge of how disease works, a deep knowledge of the mechanism of treatment, or a deep knowledge of how the treatments are distributed across populations. And that deep knowledge comes from an investigative angle. So there is no difference between real clinical excellence and research excellence. Some people really think that that's the case. It's not true. I'll give you a different example, and you can use that to plan where you go. There are people who do yeast cell cycle genetics who are plenty smart and capable who do it as a full-time job. There are people who do leukemia medicine is a full-time job. And if you're going to do each of them as a half-time job, you got to be really good to keep up. Mm-hmm. So the answer to that is if you look at me as a genital urinary oncologist, you're starting to focus on a small collection of diseases. Ironically enough, when we started, the clinical footprint was a little bit away from prostate cancer, but prostate cancer exploded while I was in that game. Then I became a sort of a, a molecular biology of prostate uh, carcinogenesis and uh, mostly at that point because it's the disease bias, mostly a prostate cancer medical oncologist. And at that point, the two things add up on each other. I can remember seeing a, a patient came for an opinion who was, I don't know, some financier or something who could shop around for treatment. And he came with a whole bunch of clinical trials, not just the materials that they're distributed to the patients, but he had the investigator brochures. He had papers he carved out of the literature and whatnot. It was clear that he wasn't actually a scientist. He, his roommate, I think, or something like that from college was at the Scripps or the Salk or something. He was a reasonable molecular biologist. And he came with a very focused question. At that time, uh, Merck had had a so-called pharmacyl transferase inhibitor. It prevented the post-translational modification on RAS that was needed to get it to the membrane. And uh, they were exploring the use of this compound in early trials for people with RAS mutations, driving cancers. And there were some data collected by one of my colleagues in New York, Neil, Neil Rosen, that suggested that agent was equally effective or was very effective at controlling cancer growth, even if the RAS uh, uh, protein wasn't a mutant protein. So he brought all these things and said, look, I've been offered participation in a clinical trial of this RAS, uh, uh, by this pharmaceutical transferase inhibitor. And he asked me, do you know about this paper? Do you know about this paper? Do you know about this paper? I said, Sure. And he said, well, the basic question I have for you is I'm willing to participate in clinical trials. I look on, you know, the website, which is now clinicaltrials.gov. I think it was called something else at the time. And he says, you know, there's like 50 clinical trials across the country. I figure I can participate in at most three in my lifespan. And I want to know, I know you can't tell me whether or not the drug's going to work, but I want to know what's your best educated guess as to how this drug might perform and how it might perform for me. And you realize at that point that that's a very sophisticated question, right, that requires deep knowledge of the science underlying how prostate cancer cells work, lots of knowledge of all the preclinical information related to how particular agents work, 
And all these things come to you if you focus on prostate cancer, not just to take care of people, but to improve their care. And you sit on committees, you advise drug companies, you review grants, and you are at that point an elite clinician that no one who only does clinical medicine can even get close to, if you see what I mean. What else, Dr. Nelson, do you think really contributed to the degree of success that you've had? What other ingredients do you think played a role? If you want to be a medical oncologist, you have to train as a medical oncologist. And at that point, you sort of have a union card. I'm, I'm a medical oncologist. It means you're not a surgeon. You're not a lawyer. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, an approach to thinking about disease. And there are active credentials that you need to secure, right? So you can get credentials to give people chemotherapy and the like. So, so there's the structure training things that lead to credentials. And I, I say this, I know it's kind of obvious, but if, if you want to be a surgeon, I'm amazed still that you'll see clinical trials that come out of the Society for Surgical Oncology and stuff, which are basically drug trials. <laughs> so if you wanted to be a drug person, you should think deeply about drugs, which means you're not a surgeon anymore, right? If, if you see what I mean. But anyway, I think the key to that is in the training experience at some point to build craft, right? And that craft is you really want to have something that is a, a set of skills, a perspective that is invaluable to the team that will ultimately take on the disease clinically and in a research way. I think neither you nor I is going to go be lost on an island somewhere and conjure up the cure for CLL <laughs> by ourselves, right? So it's going to be a process which you interact with collaborators, competitors, outside agents, and whatnot. So the key is, what do you bring to the table? Dr. Nelson, how did you cultivate your deep expertise in prostate cancer? What did you do to become that involved? Well, prostate cancer, like I say, it was presented as an opportunity. Our urologist here approached uh, someone, uh, Jonathan Simons and I. Jonathan had been one of my roommates in medical school. He went off to the you know, mass gym, but he'd come back. And Pat Walsh, who was at a urology at the time, who'd refined the radical prostatectomy, had approached us and said, look, I think that we should have medical oncology doing drugs, and we're willing to work with you if you will take the disease as seriously as we do. And it was a little bit of a leap of faith, but we knew the urology people pretty well, so uh, we jumped into it. And I learned a lot about the prostate and sex accessory tissues and prostate development. You have to learn a lot about it. That's just the knowledge base. My perspective was really a little bit more of that of pharmacology. I got my formal PhD in pharmacology. So I think a lot about drugs. I have formal training in all the things you think about with drugs. You know, how do inhibitors work, enzyme kinetics, uh, receptor binding kinetics, structural biology in terms of how drugs work, chemical biology in terms of how drug works, and clinical pharmacology, a dying art. So that's the deep expertise I applied. Having trained and mentored hundreds and thousands of you know students, residents, fellows, attendings even, Dr. Nelson, what are some of the, the common traits of the most successful of these that you found? Well, there's two things I'll tell you. One, on the, on, on the clinical side and the art of medicine, mm -hmm. and uh, by now you figured this out, the time is more valuable than knowledge to patient care. I mean, yeah. that's what people really want from you. They want to spend some time with you. And that's hard and it's at a premium in the way healthcare is delivered now. If you look on the, uh, to make it as an academic person, I think the biggest challenge that's evolved now is it's easy to collect a large amount of data. In fact, it's easy to collect a very large amount of data. At, at this point, the, the amount of people who are critical thinkers has become quite limited, I have to say. And that is a premium quality. If you see it in a trainee, uh, you will suck it up. And me and others have tried to figure out what, why is this happening and can we can we cultivate this? I think there's a lot of drivers. If you do sort of molecular biology research, you see a paper. It's got five figures. Each one of them has panels out to like P or Q. And then you have 87,000 supplemental figures. And the idea is if you paper over enough data, you don't have to ask a scientific question. It's practically in that range in my view. But there's a, someone else who was uh, worked in the laboratory of someone when I first came here who's gotten quite well known 
for these workshops and stuff on for young biomedical scientists named uh, Tang Tian Sun, Henry Sun. I think there's going to be a book coming out from Elsevier's. His first uh, tenet is always don't trust authority, right? So people read all the stuff in the literature and say, oh, this has to be true. Oh, it's been solved. And I think critical thinking and critical question asking is the hardest thing to teach. It's the hardest thing to learn. And that's the rarest trait. But you mentioned that in the art of medicine, you know, time is more important, is more valued than knowledge. What do you mean by that? And how can we use that? Well, it's just anytime you really ask patients about anything. In fact, there's a ton of different data on this. You'll find if you want to see if your uh, medical oncologists actually don't get sued for malpractice very often, but in businesses where there's a lot of that, like, you know, neurosurgery, spine surgery or something, mm-hmm. if you make a mistake and you sit down for two hours and tell somebody about it and what the consequences are and what you're going to do about it, so they don't sue you. Mm-hmm. 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 And I think that it, you don't do this just not to get sued, but it's telling you that there's a great hunger for that kind of interaction, that uh, you know, to get all their questions answered. You know, that they don't feel like you came in and said, you know, you go sit over there and get this drug and I'll see you later. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't want that kind of I think we've, we've talked about a lot of things. But Dr. Nelson, if there was one thing that you had to tell from your experience to young residents like myself to be successful in medicine and in life, what would that one thing be? Well, medicine's easy. I think you uh, go after something and really try to understand it deeply and try to figure stuff out. I mean, I think that's that's basically the mandate. Mm-hmm. I think life is a little bit more elusive. I mean, particularly as culture changes and expectations change, the world has changed uh, significantly. And in the generation of people coming up, they're looking for a different character of training experiences. They're looking for different uh, features of the life they want to live. Mm-hmm. And there's all kinds of social pressures that you have to be immersed in, you can't be independent of in medicine, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. more people are living together, not getting married, getting married later, having children later. I mean, the, the, the the culture is very much changing. In medical education, there's been a lot of attention to this in the, in the recent years. I, most medical education that I can think of in my generation, in most places, Almost everyone can relate to you some story of some, you know, often a surgeon, not always, but often a surgeon who everyone sort of feared and was sort of a titanic jackass in one way or another. But the sort of uh, the notion was if you went into the operating room with this person or you went in front of them to present a case or whatever it was, that you were expecting effectively to be belittled and abused and told you didn't know anything or what have you. But then surviving that experience somehow would make you stronger and more resilient. If you see what I mean, it's kind of like the way they train Marines at Paris Island, right? (laughs) It's yell at you. You're an idiot. You're stupid. That, That training mode is whether or not it was really valuable or not, you could clearly debate, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to train people that way anymore. We're expecting different to performance of everybody who comprise our workspace. And you're getting into these issues about how should we best train people. I think uh, by, by now you figured this out if you're in medical training. I mean, in the 60s was the last uh, generation. I still did a little bit when I was a resident, but in the 60s, you'd have somebody, you know, who would prove to have obstructive jaundice. You realize it would take, you know, eight or nine days to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like most places you'd come in and the laboratories that ran the blood test did them enzymologically. They ran twice a week, liver enzymes. Mm-hmm. They didn't have ultra, they'd have imaging studies, right? So if somebody came in jaundice and itching, it took you, you know, eight, nine days to figure out they had obstructive jaundice. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. And so most of the time they were in the hospital and you had a chance from an educational perspective as a student or a resident to really get a sense to watch them to query them about symptoms, and you didn't have to get all the information from them in the first three minutes of your encounter, right? You go back and see them. How are you feeling today? What's different? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that basically the fact that in-hospital care is ungodly inefficient was a tremendous teaching advantage. Mm -hmm. 
you admit somebody to the hospital, they're just going to sit there. You have them in prison, right? So you can go back and re-examine them. <laughs> you can go send a medical student. You can go say, knock yourself out. A medical student, you go take a history, right? Mm-hmm. The problem now is that uh, most conditions don't stay in the hospital, particularly in oncology, right? And if you're not going to be in the hospital, how are you going to get that training? You say, well, you're going to get it in an outpatient setting. The problem with getting that training in an outpatient setting is that you know, efficiency is at a premium. So I worry about how and where are we going to teach people about our about medicine. I think that's the biggest challenge. Also, looking back, you know, on your career since you've entered medicine, what do you think was the turning point? The turning point? Uh, don't know. I can remember uh, <laughs> meeting a number of great figures in, in medicine and science, and they all say the same thing, all of them. They just said, you know, I just tried to do my best every day, tried to figure out stuff, and in the end, uh, you know, I made big discoveries, won Nobel Prizes, whatever I did. They all tell you the same thing. You just have to have an ethic of you're trying to figure stuff out every day. So I don't think it's one of those ones where you turn right and, you know, you're Jennifer Lawrence, the movie star, you know, two days before you were worried about getting a prom dress for your high school. I think it doesn't work that way in our business. You're rewarded for your the sustained application of your skills to a problem. And it's more of a journey than it is a, a turn, if you will. Thank you for tuning in with us here on Medical Mentors as we listen to helping words from leaders in medicine. Dr. Nelson gave us a lot to think about in terms of research and clinical practice, critical thinking, and how to navigate the complex world we face. Please do keep him in mind as inspiration for Excel. And please do subscribe to stay updated on our newest episodes featuring the insights of top physicians. And do comment about your experiences to keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this opportunity to learn from the Masters of Medicine.